Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Jeffrey Corrier, and on behalf of Melinda Roy, I'm presenting information in relation to the violent death of her mother that uh, have been published in media in New Brunswick, especially in the late 1990s. Now, this article from an August 22nd uh, publication, uh, 98 in the, the Moncton Times, gives details on what happened to her mother, uh, Jean Sivret, and the, uh, the breakdown of the case as investigated by police authorities and uh, various agencies. On Sunday, May 11, 1986, Jean Sivret, wearing a white blouse and blue trousers, set out for a morning walk with her dog. At 11 a.m., she left through the back door, walked across the yard, passed the small shed, and finally made it to the railroad tracks. She walked those tracks a hundred times over, always turning back for home uh, once she reached an old railway bridge some two and a half miles away. On her way back, a man who police think is a relative attacked her. In the struggle, her glasses fell on the tracks. She managed, managed to break free from, free from his grip and start running for the woods. Her attacker caught up to her, threw her down to the ground, picked up a long piece of wood and likely a branch from a dead tree, and then began swinging it at her head. He hit her so many times that the piece of wood broke in two. He then grabbed her by the shoulder, dragged her a short distance, and rolled her down a slight embankment, leaving her for dead at the foot of a spruce tree. Her, bra, her blouse had been pulled upwards, partially exposing her chest. There was no evidence indicating that she had been sexually assaulted. Now day turned to night, and she still hadn't returned. Her purse was still on her old singer sewing stool, and her light blue two-door Chev uh, Chevette hatchback was still parked in the drive. More, Madame Sevrette was not the kind of person to simply take off without telling anyone. It was Mother's Day, and her son was thinking of coming up for a visit, and the neighbors had invited them over for a supper that night. By morning, there was still no sign of her. Her husband left for work that morning, as it would were any other day, rolling out of the drive in his beige, navy-trimmed Ford Ranger. Twenty-three hours later had passed since she went for that walk, and still no one, not even her husband, had called the police. She was reported missing on May 12, 86, at 11 a.m., the 24th hour. Her children eventually grew worried after learning she, she wasn't around, and he didn't make it to work that day. The news quickly ricocheted through the family with calls to almost every relative, most of them showing up to help search. The night, for, night before, Melinda Roy woke up in a cold sweat. She was screaming for her mother. She passed it off as a bad nightmare and went back to sleep. A day later, she was huddled with her sisters at the old family home in rough waters. It was getting dark, and she was getting tired of waiting for the phone to ring. Around 8.30 p.m., the sight of a grim-faced brother-in-law walking up the drive drained all hope that her mother would return alive and well. That week, at her funeral, emotions ran high, eventually dividing the family. The police mounted in an intensive investigation, questioning several people, including her husband. The investigation dragged on for years, and every now and then, people came forward with new information that kept them pointing fingers at one suspect. The police filed a brief in '96, but prosecutors never laid charges against the suspect because he didn't think they would win the conviction. They won't leave me alone, says a rumpled Ernest Severet, 61. Hours away in Woodstock, his estranged daughter is still pressing authorities for justice. She has promised herself to never stop fighting for answers, no matter if the police investigation in her mind is moving sluggishly. I don't think the police are doing enough, she said. They are not going out of the way at all. She is not alone. Several family members have been writing authorities about the case for years. They are always told the same thing. That is not evidence to win a conviction against a probable author of Jean Sivret's slaying. Their contempt for authorities and a murder one of their own has left the family in tatters. The family has virtually fallen apart with sisters turning against sisters. One family member also changed his name to escape life as a Sivret. The murder in the family fallout that followed left Melinda Roy only 18 at the time of the killing, seemingly alone. I felt... Uh, I felt more or less that I grew up alone. One of her worst fears is that her mother and her murder will be forgotten, just another old cold case in the North Shore collecting dust in a yellowing police file. 
I don't want it to be put on the back burner. The truth is that the police investigation is at a virtual standstill and shall remain so until fresh evidence is uncovered or someone comes forward with new information. They, like Melinda Roy, are hoping that they can one day crack the case open once and for all. In life, Jean Severet deserved better. A compassionate mother who kept her problems to herself, she endured too many years of torment from the man she married. In debt, she is and always will be remembered by a family divided. Her children, like their mother before them, have until now kept her pain and her stories of family strife a private affair. Slowly, they are learned to speak out with the hopes that something will lead to break in the case, or at the very least, that recounting the life of their mother, however troubled, may help heal their wounds.